Section number 49 of Reviews by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter. July 2007. Reviews by Oscar Wilde. Edited by Robert Ross. Section 49. Mr. Pater's Imaginary Portraits. To convey ideas through the medium of images has always been the aim of those who are artists as well as thinkers in literature, and it is to a desire to give a sensuous environment to intellectual concepts that we owe Mr. Pater's last volume. For these imaginary, or, as we should prefer to call them, imaginative portraits of his, form a series of philosophic studies in which the philosophy is tempered by personality, and the thought shown under varying conditions of mood and manner, the very permanence of each principle gaining something through the change and color of the life through which it finds expression. The most fascinating of all these pictures is undoubtedly that of Sebastian van Storck. The account of Watteau is perhaps a little too fanciful, and the description of him as one who was, quote, always a seeker after something in the world, that is, there is no satisfying measure, or not at all, unquote, seems to us more applicable to him who saw Mona Lisa sitting among the rocks than to the gay and debonair Bientre des Fêtes Galantes. But Sebastian, the grave young Dutch philosopher, is charmingly drawn, from the first glimpse we get of him, skating over the water-meadows with his plume of squirrel's tail and his fur muff, in all the modest pleasantness of boyhood, down to his strange death in the desolate house amid the sands of the Helder, we seem to see him, to know him, almost to hear the low music of his voice. He is a dreamer, as the common phrase goes, and yet he is poetical in this sense, that his theorems shape life for him directly. Early in youth he is stirred by a fine saying of Spinoza, and sets himself to realize the ideal of an intellectual disinterestedness, separating himself more and more from the transient world of sensation, accident, and even affection, till what is finite and relative becomes of no interest to him, and he feels that as nature is but a thought of his, so he himself is but a passing thought of God. This conception of the power of a mere metaphysical abstraction over the mind of one so fortunately endowed for the reception of the sensible world is exceedingly delightful, and Mr. Pater has never written a more subtle psychological study, the fact that Sebastian dies in an attempt to save the life of a little child, giving to the whole story a touch of poignant pathos and sad irony. Denis Loiro is suggested by a figure found, or said to be found, on some old tapestries in Oer, the figure of a flaxen and flowery creature, sometimes well-nigh naked among the vine-leaves, sometimes muffled in skins against the cold, sometimes in the dress of a monk, but always with a strong impress of real character and incident from the veritable streets of the town itself. From this strange design Mr. Pater has fashioned a curious medieval myth of the return of Dionysus among men, a myth steeped in color and passion and old romance, full of wonder and full of worship, Denis himself being half animal and half god, making the world mad with a new ecstasy of living, stirring the artists simply by his visible presence, drawing the marvel of music from reed and pipe, and slain at last in the stage play by those who had loved him. In its rich affluence of imagery, this story is like a picture by Montaigne, and indeed Montaigne might have suggested the description of the pageant in which Denis rides upon a gaily painted chariot in soft silken raiment, and for headdress a strange elephant scalp with gilded tusks. If Denis Loiro symbolizes the passion of the senses, and Sebastian van Storck the philosophic passion, as they certainly seem to do, though no mere formula or definition can adequately express the freedom and variety of the life that they portray, 
the passion for the imaginative world of art is the basis of the story of Duke Karl of Rosenmold. Duke Karl is not unlike the late King of Bavaria, in his love of France, his admiration for the Grand Monarch, and his fantastic desire to amaze and to bewilder, but the resemblance is possibly only a chance one. In fact, Mr. Pater's young hero is the precursor of the Aufklärung of the last century, the German precursor of Herder and Lessing and Goethe himself, and finds the forms of art ready to his hand, without any national spirit, to fill them, or make them vital and responsive. He too dies, trampled to death by the soldiers of the country he so much admired, on the night of his marriage with a peasant girl, the very failure of his life lending him a certain melancholy grace and dramatic interest. On the whole, then, this is a singularly attractive book. Mr. Pater is an intellectual impressionist. He does not weary us with any definite doctrine, or seek to suit life to any formal creed. He is always looking for exquisite moments, and, when he has found them, he analyzes them with delicate and delightful art, and then passes on, often to the opposite pole of thought or feeling, knowing that every mood has its own quality and charm, and is justified by its mere existence. He has taken the sensationalism of Greek philosophy, and made it a new method of art criticism. As for his style, it is curiously ascetic. Now and then we come across phrases with a strange sensuousness of expression, as when he tells us how Denis Loiro, on his return from a long journey, quote, ate flesh for the first time, tearing the hot, red morsels with his delicate fingers in a kind of wild greed, unquote but such passages are rare. Asceticism is the keynote of Mr. Pater's prose. At times it is almost too severe in its self-control, and makes us long for a little more freedom. For, indeed, the danger of such prose as his is that it is apt to become somewhat laborious. Here and there one is tempted to say of Mr. Pater that he is, quote, a seeker after something in language that is therein no satisfying measure, or not at all. Unquote. The continual preoccupation with phrase and epithet has its drawbacks as well as its virtues, and yet, when all is said, what wonderful prose it is, with its subtle preferences, its fastidious purity, its rejection of what is common or ordinary. Mr. Pater has the true spirit of selection, the true tact of omission. If he be not among the greatest prose writers of our literature, he is, at least, our greatest artist in prose, and though it may be admitted that the best style is that which seems an unconscious result rather than a conscious aim, still in these latter days when violent rhetoric does duty for eloquence and vulgarity usurps the name of nature, we should be grateful for a style that deliberately aims at perfection of form, that seeks to produce its effect by artistic means, and sets before itself an ideal of grave and chastened beauty. End of section 49 Mr. Pater's Imaginary Portraits